or do a setup. Oh, nope, my computer will fold. Let's not do this. Can can this computer go? Can this computer go? Um, I am best known for a game called Fingal, which is an awkward finger rubbing game, um, which kind of crushed a lot of relationships <laughs> and is still doing so. Uh, people, two people put down one hand each on an iPad and they have to um, move their hands in a way that makes them do this. It's really awkward. It's really nasty and sweaty, and it's really the kind of stuff that I like making. Um, so that's what I'm best known for. Another game I made is called Bounden, and it's a mobile dancing game. Two people hold on to one phone, and the phone kind of tells them how to move synchronously. Um, basically, they do a choreography together. Am I connected to that? So that's the two games I'm best known for. I'm currently also um, organizing a small event called PlayDev Club, which is basically uh, game designers coming together to talk about their work in progress, their games in progress, so that um, game designers can talk about each other's work before it's said and done, which is not really the sort of community that exists in the Netherlands currently. So I think it's really important that people you know, talk about game design and talk about the things that they're working on so that we can all kind of help each other at making each other's games better. Um, so that's what I'm currently organizing. I think you might need to the adapter in again. Mine doesn't work if you do the adapter first and the VGA second. Okay. Uh, Let's see what happens. Ooh, yes, my screen is super small now, so this must work. Yay. Yay. Okay, so, um, game, game often I told you about it, and we'll just have audio from this thing, I guess. It doesn't matter. I don't really need the audio. That's not a good idea. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. You know, finger rubbing. Let me actually put this to... Um, yeah, I will. I, I will use this now. Um, Let me put this to mirroring, not mirroring. Poof! Oh no, it made the wrong screen. My primary. Okay, here we go. Oh, Mectrix. Ooh. Okay. So let's pl hit play. Yeah, we've seen this. Okay, so Bounden looks a bit like this. Yeah, we came up with this sort of interface and, you know, makes people move like this. Um, then another game made, French Trap. Uh, this doesn't need any sound. This is two people grab onto one phone and when you let go, you lose. Um, it's really silly, it's really stupid, and then there's awkward conversation topics on top of the screen. And um, while you're not really forced to talk about it, people do so anyway, and it's, it's almost, a hundred, it, like, it almost always works. And um, I don't know, I, I, I consider this maybe to be one of my best games, um, even though practically nobody downloaded it. So um, this is another thing I'm really proud of, 52. Um, well, let's just skip, skip through that. Um, another web tool I made for game developers to have contracts with each other, but I'm gonna talk about game design today, uh, events, um, I have the game industry calendar that kind of stuff, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, what we're going to talk about today is these things. Game design, uh, Q there's going to be a little time for Q&A, and we're going to talk about game mechanics, something I presumably think I know something about. Um, but first, before I start talking about game design, I <coughs> need you to understand that actually I think talking about game design is really hard. And I'm going to shoot, my, shoot myself in the foot by telling you that I think most knowledge about game design is either out of context or non-practical or too general or boxing creativity or not really about game design. So imagine the following knowledge. Knowledge. Players always respond like X to Y. If you, if you go to, so let's say you go to a website like Gamasutra, which is like the, the leading mobile 
of a leading uh, game industry um, place for people to write down their thoughts on game design and, uh, and art and all game industry related uh, knowledge and, and thoughts. This is the kind of stuff that you often find there. Um, so I think all of these things are really out of context, um, which is I think a big problem to to game design and kind of stopping stopping you from uh, um, from doing the things that you need to do. Here's uh, some other examples where this is just really vague. It's not really practical. It's very general advice. Designers need to play innovative games. You need to learn the rules before you break them. Make it fun or any sentence with simple and intuitive. These are the kinds of things that I, d I don't think are necessarily going to help you um, ma become a better game designer. Stuff like this, I think, is also very constraining, uh, really boxing creativity. So uh, I hate the word creativity and also hate the word boxing, but uh, I, s I hope you know what I mean. Um, stuff like this is often very constrained to what you, can, what you allow yourself to think about uh, when you want to do game design. And then there's also a lot of stuff like when people talk about tools, um, that a lot of people think that the tools are game design, but that's, I don't think that's really true. So this kind of knowledge is, I think, a, hu a huge distraction. And I, I think it's really important for you to know that I think about it like that. Um, but unfortunately, it's also really difficult for, uh, for, for me if, or for anyone else to escape this kind of useless knowledge, um, including me. So I will try really hard to, uh, to tell you some useful things today. And um, I, yeah, I hope that I, w I will, uh, will be able to tell you some things that if you continue to work on your games after this week, you'll know exactly where to start and what to do, and you'll have some like handles to to work on. I don't know. I don't think I know exactly how everything works, um, but in a way, I think all of you are probably on the same level as I am when it comes to practical game design, where you just have to really do things. Um, and uh, one day I hope I will be as good of a game designer as you guys are. Ooh. So I <coughs> had to ask myself what is really useful for you to hear. And the thing that game designers design, the things that they make are very context sensitive. So they're, they're really only applicable in the situation they were created in. And I think most of that kind of stuff is not really useful for what you will be doing in your future. So. I think that talking about designs will not really teach you about designing, just like looking at and talking about a painting is not necessarily going to teach you a lot about painting. <coughs> How to paint? Yeah. I think that game design is not really a knowledge base which tells you which designs to apply to make your game better or something. It's not like a framework that you apply or a structure that you you just stick to and then suddenly poof you can make games um, so now that all of you know this that this is my point of view I hope to talk about practical game design today and um, not really the theory behind it because if you're mainly interested in that you should become an academic and I'm not uh, an academic at all um, does that sound okay I am um, I'm wondering who here has the ambition to become a game designer some hands, okay, who who wants to do a bit of game design at least? Yeah, okay, so I guess almost everyone, if not everyone. Okay, good. Um, it's really important that um, you don't leave your questions till the end. Just raise your hand and uh, say, hey, I have a question or something. Um, because your understanding of what I'm going to be talking about today is also a process. And it's it's really... This talk, my talk, will be really useless for you if there's a point where you just don't get it anymore and I, because I have, I've not told you the right things or I've forgot to tell you important stuff. So um, tell me if I need to slow down or clarify something. Okay, this uh, actually I think my talk is kind of feels like a philosophy lesson right now. Uh, maybe game design and philosophy have become the same to me, but uh, anyway. so. Game design, yay. I think um, game design roles slash subcategories within game design all kind of share the same, the same common goal. And then I'm talking about gameplay designers, I'm talking about level design, 
interface design, world design, system design, narrative design, and writers. I think they all share the same common goal, which is to kind of steer a player um, through one or multiple reactions. And it'd be a line of thought or an emotional reaction, so, or a feeling or something like that. So with that in mind, um, I think the player and his mind are central to game design. And I think with with everything you want to make, you need to think about what the player will, th what the player will think about, and make us also kind of make assumptions on how effective the things will be um, in making the players think about those things. And that's, I think, what uh, a big part of uh, game design is about. So let me just illustrate that. Um, let's say in your designer's mind, you want the player to feel jealous when playing your game. So you come up with these features. A and B, and you have the idea that, oh, well, A is going to be like this subtle subtle hint, and uh, it's kind of going to make people feel jealous in a way. And then there's also this B thing, which is like full-blown, out there, this is going to make you feel jealous. I know exactly that I need to do it like this. This is often how my designs start. Um, However, almost always, this tree of relationships between what I want and what I, uh, what should cause the things I want, and that tree really quickly expands into much larger trees. So say I, I start playtesting this, turns out that A, the subtle thing, doesn't work at all, and that B needs additional features, and in order to get people feel, to feel jealous after seeing them play my prototype, I'll probably also need C and D, and you can, see, you can see how quickly this turns into like a massive tree with thousands of features and lots of ideas, and like this all needs to happen in my mind. It's, it's really crazy. Anyway, this is already becoming kind of knowledge thing, so I need to step away from this again. But I just wanted to kind of start with a sort of strange nebula of what game design is. Um, but the more practical point I want to make is that <coughs> game design and design in general feel a lot like searching for something, something more effective than other things. So you want to find something that does the thing you want. And I think that's really practical because searching for something is something you can do, right? It's an action. It's, it's, that's practical. And how effective something is can be measured. So let's start about what we're searching for ideas. I looked up what idea meant. <laughs> um, it was very strange, but it's a, a thought for a possible course of action. So we need ideas to get going, to start with things, right? Um, to do things, to make things, smaller things, bigger things. You all know this, obviously, and it also won't surprise you that everyone here has like a thousand ideas all the time. Um, and everyone can get ideas, it's, it's not a surprise. But what I think most people are really naive towards is that almost all of our ideas are hugely incomplete. Just hugely incomplete. And that what I mean with that is we misunderstand the impl implications of our ideas. So if an idea is just an idea to get started, right? A, a thing to, to know that um, you want to execute something and you want to put it out there and you start doing that, but it turns out that while you're doing those things, you haven't seen all these other things that are connected to it. So ideas are really incomplete in that way, and that's, I guess, also inherent to ideas. It's not like you can always know upfront what's going to happen. Um, so yeah, I, so this, these, the fact that ideas are incomplete is often really, it becomes really painfully obvious when you, when you um, execute them. And I also think that ideas are like fucking cheap. Like they're so cheap. And um, having several, having released several games now, I've given less and less value to ideas. Um, I'll give a workshop later today and it's, it's going to be primarily focusing on generating ideas. And I hope all of you will realize how, how cheap ideas are. They're really cheap really easy to get, um, but they're still really fundamental to game design, I think. Um, what's less cheap, though, um, and often leading to ideas, is visions. 
But before I talk about visions, I need everyone to get up and to do some, a bit of stretching. It's, it's important. So normally, when I'm behind a computer, um, as we're all game designers, I have a timer on my computer, which, r which goes off every half an hour. And um, I, I need to do jumping jacks for two minutes. Now, I won't force you all to do jumping jacks right now. That's maybe a bit too much. But make sure that like all the, the muscles in your back and your neck and your shoulders are a bit, you know, you can move those hips a bit if you want to. Ooh, yeah. Nice, Dino. Nice. Um, OK. Anyway, good. That's, uh, that's nice. Remember, your body is, an, is important for you uh, if you want to do anything. OK, vision. So do not mistake a vision for an idea. A vision uh, usually starts with a game about something, um, as opposed to a game in which the player. It's a vision kind of describes the experience that you'd like to be in the player's mind. And it could be a feeling, a realization, or like another point, uh, a thing, something big and neb nebulous. And you don't know exactly the, the, the exact way how you're going to do it, but you have this idea of like the, the final thing. If, you're, if your game is going to be doing one thing, only one thing, it is that thing. And that's your vision. It's kind of an overarching concept. That's how you could see it. Um, but what's really important to note here is that Visions can have many different ways of execution. And this was a huge realization to me. And this is partly why I devalue, devalue ideas. Um, but more on that during the, during the workshop. So some visions I've had for my games um, with the finger rubbing game, I wanted people to feel really awkward, right? Um, in the in uh, French trap, I wanted people to just talk about awkward stuff, talk about stuff they never wanted to talk about. And with Bounin, I wanted people to dance together. That's the vision. And again, these things don't imply at all any practical way of making the game, right? Okay, let's make a game about dancing together. Where do you start? And for that, you need a lot of ideas. Um, so that's kind of what a, what a vision is. And, um, and how it kind of works. So visions are, I think, almost always inspired by real life uh, experiences. And a vision is not just inspirational, but it can also be used to decide which ideas to execute and which ideas to leave for another game. So it's really about using your vision. And uh, to illustrate that, if your vision is to make people dance in real life, uh, maybe the, that idea with the, this cool platformer control thing you came up with, the, the con control scheme, um, it doesn't fit, you know? Dancing and making people do this actual movement and pressing buttons on the keyboard to make your uh, character jump, it, it doesn't fit. And this might sound super logical to you, um, but I think most game designers bring default game elements in their game uh, without giving it much thought. They bring in knowledge, right? Uh, they bring in uh, conventions, very e simple things. And uh, I'm also guilty of that. Um, and for Fingal, for instance, we had a, a, a two-layered level selection menu, which allowed players to select specific levels. Um, and while probably all of you are like, well, no, that's, that's a good feature, right? I mean, why wouldn't I? Why wouldn't I want to do that? Um, but in hindsight, I've become pretty certain that this level selection thing is entirely redundant, and um, that the selects that the selection of like a pack, which represents a feeling, um, and keeping them small enough, um, is probably a much clearer way to communicate what the decision for people is. Um, so yeah, we, we brought this in without giving it a second thought. And in hindsight, after like working on this for a month, uh, shit, you know, <laughs> this is what we've done by accident. It would have cost us considerably less time to make uh, the thing uh, we came up with in hindsight. But I guess that's, that applies for everything. So here's another example. This is me uh, four days ago. Um, if your vision is to make people feel what it's like to clamber, so that's kind of, you know, 
running over stones, bigger stones, on top of a, uh, a, a, s a small mountain creek or something. Um, then maybe an advanced dialogue system will not really contribute to that feeling specifically. And again, that really makes sense, I guess. Um, but you really need to think about this. Um, so I think like being effective in that sense, effective game design means to find ways to achieve your vision, but at the same time, it's also effective game design to pretty much discard all other ideas um, that are not in some way contributing to your vision. And that is something you, you can practically work with to, to check whether everything you come up with aligns with your vision and if not, you throw it away, or you find a middle ground, or you try to figure out for yourself why you came up with that feature in the first place, and maybe you need to change your vision uh, based on that. Um, but I think making a coherent design, a, a, a game design, a design which tries to put people into one very specific um, um, experience is a very co coherent and, and therefore m probably more effective design. Um, people will get it more easily and you will be able to focus your development more. This, this is, I, I think, a thing you can use for production. Um, but I guess uh, you will talk about that later. Um, so is there any questions on this already? If not, that's also okay. Yes? Yes, I will, I will do that. Yes, I will distribute it through the man in the back. Ching. Any other questions? Did you, you were pointing? Oh, yeah? Huh? I don't know. Okay, that's okay. Just pointing at people. Okay, so um, after you've got your vision and uh, you have a bunch of ideas to make that vision work, I think the next logical step is um, prototyping. And um, prototyping is... Um, you make a, a shitty version of something for various reasons, among which the most obvious is probably uh, playtesting. But there are also other things really interesting about playtesting, uh, about creating a prototype. And I'd like to tell you about that through an anecdote of my internship at uh, W Games. This was, how many years ago? Five, five years ago, whoa. Um, so at the time of my internship, W Games, which is a fairly large studio, 50 people in Amsterdam, was making uh, Gatling gears. Probably none of you know it. Um, oh, you do! Congratulations! Um, it is a cool game. Um, it's just a really beautiful game. I was uh, one of six on the design team working on an internal wiki to um, write down our designs, uh, making level layouts on paper and uh, character designs and discussing how the story should progress and doing the interface and the system design and the scoring and attending daily meetings, uh, doing scrum things and uh, meetings with gameplay programmers, you know, what uh, game designers do. Um, and I learned many things there, but there was actually one specific event that really, really stood out. I, um, a few months into my internship, I think three months or so, the project was probably like, there for half a year, maybe even longer. Um, the senior designer called Kent Cunet came to the office unexpectedly showing a prototype of the playable character. And it walked and shot and animated exactly like he had in mind. So Kent did not have prototyping in his job description, which is why it was um, unexpected. In fact, I think nobody at W Games had prototyping in the job description. I think the structure at W Games was much like what I was taught at school back then. You make design documents, uh, a game designer designs a feature, then a programmer programs the feature, after which an artist implements the art, and a sound designer, etc. But Kent decided to make a prototype of the main character to get a very practical view um, on his vision of the, uh, the main character. As well as showing, rather than telling the team, what was in his mind. So, firstly, he understood that his words, the words themselves, fell inherently short when he had to accurately express his vision to the rest of the studio. So, as the game designer, he asked other people in the studio to do things with his ideas 
without understanding how the hell they were doing it. You can imagine that making beautiful code or making beautiful art or audio or music is a mysterious craft to many of them. I, I bet most of you only know like one thing, one of these fields, like really deeply. Um, so I want to illustrate to you how it's, how, it's, how it's true that his words fell inherently short. So did you all know? As, uh, how many people here are programmers and would consider themselves programmers? Okay. Probably you guys know that there are at least 10 ways to make a, char a character accelerate if you press left or decelerate. At least 10 ways. Um, and every specific implementation has a completely different feel to it. As a designer, um, how do you know which implementation is going to fit best without knowing exactly what they are and what they do? So first, as, an, as a non-coding designer, you're forced to explain your vision uh, using words such, a, such as easing or accelerate or naturally or intuitively. But these don't really let you specify the kind of specific uh, acceleration if you would even know about them. Um, so then the programmer would then interpret your words, possibly interpreting it different from what you had in mind. And then on top of these things, um, the programmer also implements it um, and probably he'll make a decision whether he goes for a linear interpolation of the acceleration or he uses physics or he uses a Hermite interpolation or he uses another spline interpolation for an acceleration with more control over the data points to define the interpolation, etc. Conclusion, there are enough places for wrong interpretations and uh, wrong implementations, or wrong, um, and for your communication to fall short. So Kent also knew that his ideas of the game were very likely to change the moment he saw it in front of them. And um, his ideas grew more and more practical um, as he had more insight into the impl implications of ideas when he built the prototype himself. So it's important to also realize that ideas also continuously change. Ken's prototype showed his vision of the playable character extremely well, and uh, after being able to refine his ideas um, through coming, uh, coming up with the prototype himself, of course. So he was able to make all those really tiny decisions like acceleration and like all the other things that a programmer uh, decides on um, without ever having to put his vision into words for other people. And because he had created the prototype, he could now talk about all those super specific details and show the rest of the team what he coded, um, how the general structure of the character looked like, uh, how the, the parents uh, worked, what the root uh, object was, how he iterated on the acceleration, how quickly the head rotated relative to the body, where the pivot point was, like how the feedback of the gun worked, and many other things, right? He, he knew about all these things because he had to make them and he knew exactly how he implemented them. So when Kent initially so showed the prototype to the team, the, uh, the, the 50 people team, um, everyone in the studio, for the first time, saw the, the playable character. Um, suddenly, the entire studio had something like specific to talk about. And what I for kind of forgot to mention is that Kent built this prototype in two days, in his spare time, in the evening. Um, the team working on the character animations didn't agree on the way the animations worked. Um, the programmers were discussing how the hell they were going to implement it into their gameplay code. Um, and, you know, the audio people, they thought, oh shit, we're going to need way more sounds than we initially anticipated. You could say that a fundamental thing, such as specifics of the main character of the game, should have been defined at the very start, right? At the very start of the project. Um, but the discussions that people were now having were about the, the fine details. And now Ken's prototype functioned as a language, kind of, to communicate these details exactly as he, as he had in mind. So interestingly, Kent made his prototype almost half a year after the studio started working on the project, so why didn't he start earlier? And why did these discussions only happen after uh, Kent, my timer's actually going off, one second. I already did, I already did my jumping jacks. Um, so the people at uh, W Games 
back then highly underestimated what they could potentially learn from prototypes. We have the tendency, all of us, to be like super efficient and um, to make sure that we're not wasting time. And um, I think Kent didn't make prototypes earlier on in the project because it would not be efficient. It would cost him time and everything he would write would have to be re rewritten by the gameplay programmer. That doesn't feel efficient at all. However, with prototypes like the one Kent made, the gains in knowledge easily and exponentially outweigh the time that he spent creating the prototype. So it is, I think, absolutely certain that any gameplay programmer picking up on where Kent left off, and even though he has to redo it, the character would definitely result in a better version of the, the character that the, uh, Kent made, because they have something specific to talk about. So coming back to incomplete ideas, um, how can you know for sure that everything works the way you think? Well, you can't. Uh, you would have to see the thing in front of you and uh, see which things don't work. Ken's prototype was, I think, the first uh, time W Games saw the game, or actually, I, gu I guess they saw Ken's game um, in front of them. So for the first time, they could experience what the game would actually be like. And for them, it was a starting point to fill in the gaps and discard everything that didn't work and iterate what was already there. So Ken showed me the potential gains of prototyping and inspired me to learn basic programming. Um, after that, I, I spent three months learning programming myself. And at the end, th those three months ended when I got a burnout because I didn't uh, exercise at all and it kind of killed me physically and that's why I have the timer because I need the physical exercise. I, that's what I've been doing all my life but it really stopped when I started programming. That's not good for you. Um, so um, Ken showed me those pot the potential gains of prototyping, what inspired me to, to learn programming. He often walked into the office showing his latest experiments. Last night he made a strange networked multiplayer game or he made a kite surfing game or he made a crowd simulation game and he just taught himself for the fun of it um, to play around with it and you know he also showed me that when he faced any technical difficulty such as working with quaternions or trying to steer a physics body or something uh, he would often try to come up with uh, like a smart solution because he couldn't figure out those really difficult problems himself so he always found a way. It was, for him, it was always about finding ways to, to, to figure it out. So I think the question then really for all of you is, how far should this programming knowledge go, really? Uh, must the game designer know so much about programming that he could practically make the entire game himself without the programmer? Is that what W Games should have, should have been thinking about? And I, I guess we can easily see that something as small as an interpolation for the acceleration of a character um, can have a, a huge uh, influence on the game feel. And I think that's, some, that's what practical game designers call it. Technical game designers call it game feel. Um, when a prototype embodies like the bare bones of your concept, all those tiny details are gonna matter a lot. So, for the core mechanics, the general structure, the interface, feedback of your game, enemy behavior, specific gameplay elements, handling of specific situations, um, all, those, all that stuff is like really important uh, to get right in, in the core, right? Um, so I don't think that this means that a game designer should know about the internal workings of resource management, about the functions of a shader or networking protocols or other technical marvels. And I think to my definition of a game designer, uh, I would say that he focuses, he or she focuses on anything that directly influences the experience of the player. So prototypes can also be built to express or communicate specific things and can therefore also ignore or neglect many other things. Uh, scoping for prototyping is a, that's kind of what we're, what I want to talk about. Uh, let's say you want to validate um, the design of your scoring system. Why spend time adding anim animated characters or writing complicated shaders or optimizing the prototype's framework when it doesn't really tell you anything about the scoring system you were you wanted to work on? 
chances are that a prototype in Excel or a paper prototype would probably tell you as much about a uh, scoring system, um, whether it works or not. So <coughs> if you would set out to make a prototype about a flashlight mechanic for your first person shooter, a paper prototype will probably not be the best way to go. I think game feel relies heavily on direct visuals um, and tactile feedback, you know, getting, getting the feedback right there at that moment. And in the case of, I think, almost every video game, uh, you won't experience those kinds of things through a paper prototype. So in order to test your flashlight mechanic, you have to consider the minimum amount of engineering necessary and uh, stick to the plan. It might be tempting to make the light in your digital prototype really beautiful, um, but how much is that going to help you understand how effective that, that idea of the flashlight mechanic is? So losing yourself in over-engineering, over-optimizing, and, and making things pretty is tempting, but some things can easily be validated and communicated in simpler manners. And yeah. So, I cannot think of what design I did before I was inspired to pick up some basic programming. I'm not even sure whether I designed anything at all uh, while leaving all implementations of my ideas to other people. Um, now I see that if I myself want to design a game, I must be the one making those tiny choices, um, tweaking the feel, working on interactions or player behavior or um, not so I want to be the one tweaking all those little things not the programmer I'm working with and I'm not saying that programmers are bad designers I'm not saying that at all I'm simply saying that game uh, that programmers are also game designers so if they make all those tiny choices on how to implement a game designers feature um, then they are doing a large part of the implementation and they're also doing a large part of the design so no matter how communicative of a designer you are, and no matter how deeply you have thought about the feature, there will always be choices you cannot help the programmer with because if you cannot code, you don't know about these things. So that was a really important um, uh, thing for me. This is how I validate and communicate my ideas to others. And uh, I, if, if you want to do game design and you cannot code, I would highly, 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 highly recommend you to pick up like tutorials or scroll endlessly through script references so that um, you learn the syntax and you can Google your errors and et cetera. Start coding your own ideas. Yeah? Say again? Right, so there is of course also visual scripting languages that, uh, that, that can also help you, I guess. Yeah, it's definitely a good start, yeah. Yeah, that's a good suggestion. Um, so this was also kind of secret, not even secretly, the story on when I realized what a game designer does and uh, how I could become one. And uh, I think my next big discovery was, uh, was play testing. And uh, we're actually like half an hour later, so it's, it's stretching time again, guys. Oh, everyone's like, oh, I'm so lazy, I'm wondering it's okay, guys. Can you feel those muscles, Martin? No. No? <laughs> they, no they, got the, they went away a long time ago. Okay. Um, it's a really good question. So in, um, in my experience, that's actually a lot about um, the production of things, where if you have a deadline, then that's really where it needs to stop, right? Um, I think conceptually you could play test and prototype eternally. Um, that's of course a problem, but yeah, having like deadlines and deciding for yourself, okay, this is good enough, that's I th uh, I think based on a lot of on a lot on intuition. 
Yeah, in the time you have. Um, yeah, I, I mean, yeah, it's, it, I think it's really based on intuition. And again, I think it's also very context uh, specific. So if you, if you need to decide for yourself whether the prototype is effective enough at doing, uh, at, at, at achieving your vision. And um, yeah, I think that's, re that's really up to intuition. I, I don't think there's anything else that you can, uh, you can do there. Um, okay, so play testing. Now that I have hopefully convinced some of you to uh, start um, coding a bit, and um, you can then make your own prototype, and um, while you're making it, play test, of course, your own ideas. Uh, but to truly verify the effectiveness of your uh, design and your ideas, you'll need other people uh, to come and play your game and test it. And I just want to really quickly, even though this is like super basic stuff, take you through how to set up play tests. Maybe this is something you'll talk about as well. Maybe not. I don't know. Um, so you get some people together, obviously. Uh, friends are really cool. They're always, they're always helpful and they want to come over. But I think friends of friends are probably even better because they tend to be more honest about your design. Um, frankly, it's really scary to show your game, which is not finished at all, to, to strangers. But I think this confrontation is really necessary. I've, uh, I've done a lot of playtesting at parties which is the perfect setting for my game, uh, for my ideas, because if something doesn't work, like someone just draws a line because of all the social pressure that happens. And like that confrontation was really important to me, um, knowing exactly where the boundaries of what I could do uh, uh, lied, or when my design was just plain bad and it just didn't work. And that really gave me a, a good idea of, um, of what was wrong about the game. So this confrontation is really important. Um, but you need to find the, the right setting for yours. If you want to make a single player version, don't try to play test your game at a party. Um, it's also well known that mothers are excellent at uh, play testing. So yeah, definitely try that. Give that a try sometime. Um, this is uh, like a small trick. <laughs> Give people food. Uh, this works for me every time. <laughs> I'm also doing this for Play Dev Club and like, yeah, all the events sell out really quickly. Um, so, um, have a working build of the version uh, of, of the game, of course. The, but uh, <laughs> you'd be surprised how often like we did these final tweaks to the game that made it better so that we could include them in the playtest. And then we were there with the playtesters and the game didn't work. And we were like, ah! So... What? <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> Totally their fault. No, um, you should you should internally play test before you do a play test, all right? So that they at least can can try it. Um, yeah. So you can easily ruin entire play play testing play testing sessions uh, if your main menu is broken and you can't get into any levels, for instance. Okay. Anyway, uh, yeah, need to be prepared to write some to write down a shitload of stuff, um, and you need to let them play. You don't really need to say anything and then see what happens and write down what happens if there's something you you can see right in front of you that you didn't expect you write it down um, and if you have an idea on how to fix those things you can also immediately write those down and uh, throughout the playtest you shouldn't be afraid to to ask that that person what he's thinking what's happening in his mind or what's he doing or ask for clarification on something they did or um, you know, you want you kind of want to try to understand their their point of view. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. That's a that's a good uh, suggestion as well. Yeah. Usually, I just literally don't say anything. Yeah. Uh, just here's yeah here's the game, and if he's stuck on something, then I know what I'll have to do to fix my main menu. Right. Yeah. So um, so yeah yeah. Oh yeah. right. <laughs> I want to be smart. I want to be smart and I want to do well. And it's really hard to get people to understand. It's like the it's a prototype. <laughs> right. I huh. personally think you're ashamed if you don't understand. So playtesters feel like you are testing them. So how do, how do you overcome this problem? Be because I, 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 I can fill it in, I think. What I always tell people is like, I have this really shitty version of the game. 
And people are like, oh yeah, I mean, of course, if I don't understand, it's your fault. That's how I try to solve it usually. So I, I try to explain that too. Like, if you don't understand my fault. Right, yeah. I, I, like, don't worry. Okay. Interesting. Really interesting, interesting. It's harder with, like, with people who are comfortable with games, I think it's easier. Yeah. Right. Yeah, you're saying that if people know like conventions and games, if they press the play button and it doesn't work, they'll know, oh, this is not my fault, this is yours. Right, yeah. Yeah, it makes sense. Did you know, do you, yeah? Little thought, right? Right, yeah, yeah, that's a good suggestion. Ask them to just say anything that comes to mind. Yeah, I, I, I've, I sometimes do that, um, but then people will do it for like three or four sentences and then they get immersed into the game and they completely forget to say anything, so you'll still have to ask. But yeah, I guess if that works for some people, then that's, that sounds like a really good tactic to, uh, to get something out of a playtest. Right. Yeah. So, so you made sure that you, as a, they never felt like they were kind of talking to you as the person who made it. They were just talking about the game into vo into the void while you were still seeing everything. Right. Yeah. Also, perfectly good. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Good suggestion too. Um, yeah, okay, so I mean, I guess apparently we're all really familiar with playtesting, that's cool. And I think what's so something that nobody here said before was to never defend your design. If something, someone is complaining or something you designed didn't work and you have to, you have, you'll have to deal with it, you know? Uh, yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's your fault, player, you suck. Um, no, just shush and take it in. So unless they ex they ask for a clarification, you're obviously free to explain to them what was, what was meant to happen or uh, that something needs refinement or needs a complete redo. And if they're like really stuck, you of course can get into it again. Um, so when people suggest things to me, I usually write down, person suggests to have this thing removed or you know the suggestion. And I do that to make sure that I don't go over it later and thought it was my own thoughts because often people are like really stupid and they, they just follow whatever the design kind of leads them into. And um, I found that um, what people are saying is their problem is probably not their problem. So all the solutions they're giving you is solutions for a different problem, which is not your problem. So. That's why I always write down, if people suggest things to me, uh, this person suggests this, and then probably after that I'll write down, but probably this is his problem and I need to fix this. Um, so once you're kind of emotionally able to deal with that kind of stuff, um, and, you, and you can do this and you need things to happen after your playtest, you can start with iteration. Basically this is, like game design, pure song. This is like, I think the most purest form of game design. You have an idea, you execute it, you test it, and you repeat. And this is like the loop. And you, basically I already told you all the things I think you need for, for that, the core loop of, of what I think is game design. Which is vision, ideas, executing them, pro by prototyping them, play testing them, and then repeat the whole cycle. Um, and of course, at some point, you need to go into like an actual production version of your game, and then I guess a lot of the production um, knowledge comes into into space, which is what uh, Tina will be talking about. So um, that's kind of like as abstract as I figured I could go on like the general game design space, and I wanted to kind of uh, quickly suggest some topics where you guys might have questions about or just let you ask anything about game design that you have questions on. Um, 
So, does anyone have any questions? I have a question. Yes. What do you think about preparing the big game docs for doing? Sorry, you was like doing this, but I couldn't hear what you were saying. Okay. So it's like um, there are two schools of game design. One school tells you to do a game doc always when you're doing anything, just write it down to a game doc in a in ideas. And the other school is just like no, don't do anything like that. Just go straight to the prototyping and just code. Just forget about writing down things at first, and right. it should go through it. So what, what is your opinion on that? Well, so I think uh, it depends. It depends, of course, what you want to do with the with the design document, or what is your what is your ultimate goal, if you want to put it like that. If you need to communicate to like, I th yeah. So I mean, up my okay. I'm just gonna say out really out bluntly. I think the design documents are not a good way to go and like are old fashioned, because it's become so easy for people to make their own prototypes with tools like Unreal or Unity or Game Maker or any of, th of those. It's become so easy to make your vision, a, a, make a prototype of your vision, um, that that is a much, much more effective way of communicating your ideas to other people. Um, so that's kind of where I, what I think about. And if you, for instance, want, want to write down things for yourself, like a design document can kind of do that, but um, if you're gonna be talking to yourself, I don't necessarily think like writing a huge document with the bizarre structure is necessarily the best way to go. So I would say that a different structure would be better. Maybe just you know write down scribbles or something, um, write down your vision, write down some all your ideas, kind of try to figure out like how to fit it all together. I don't necessarily think that that needs a, a giant structure up, up ahead. So that's kind of my thoughts on, on that. You had I was just going to throw in on that, that a lot of the time when I'm working on my own stuff, especially not working with somebody else, I do find it useful to write down the vision level specifications of like, this is what I want to accomplish with this. Right, yeah. And that helps me, like have, even if it's like, you know, one paragraph, that helps me be focused and have something, after I've spent five hours on my prototype, come back to that and like, oh, am I actually hitting this or have I wandered off on some other yeah. path? Yeah, that's a, I think, a really good way of uh, working. Yeah. So what was the question over here? No, just like, OK, oh, cool, <laughs> great. Yeah, so I, I think like it can definitely go back and forth, right? Uh, you, I, I think it's really good to write things off of your, off of your mind. That's why I, I have a dummy, like a, a notebook, um, to just, if I have a thought, I write it down so that, so that I can forget about it immediately. Um, but I don't necessarily think that a design document is like the, the form that you need to th uh, throw it in. So yeah. Yeah. Well, if, you, if you sort of go into production and depending on how large your team is, it, it can be useful to document all the findings of the prototypes Definitely. in a document that people can consult. I mean, the entire d design document is not going to be relevant for every person in the team. Right. But if a person in the team has a question about a specific topic, like a character, backstory, mechanic, you can uh, reference them to the page. Like, I've written that down here. You can find more information there. I've uh, figured that out. So, right. um, so in larger teams, it becomes more relevant. Yeah. I think um, I thought about it that way too, and it didn't work for W Games at all. Like their their wiki, which was intended to do exactly that, was just read by game designers, and all the game designers were reading each other's documents and talking about it constantly. Um, so maybe within the game designer group it worked, but it didn't really work for the rest of the team because if a programmer had a question, he would just walk up to the person and ask him, hey, how does this work? Um, even though it was on the documents. And I, I remember that all the game designers were like really tired of having to tell all the other people in the studio, it's on the wiki, all right? Just go there. Um, so yeah, I, I, I do think like documentation is definitely important, but I'm also still thinking that there's probably better ways to communicate it and um, like a giant design document is maybe not the right form. That's what, I, what I'm yeah. trying to say. I might have a solution for that in the workshop. Ah, cool. Awesome. He has solutions. Um, so yeah, any other questions? Is there maybe something here that you guys really want to hear about? Like, I don't know. I like your hair. Thank you. <laughs> that was not a question though. <laughs> Do I like your hair? <laughs>
Okay. <laughs> ah, easy one. Is it easy one? Um, so yeah, I think uh, what games to finish actually have a lot to do with um, the reality of being able to finish it. So that that comes with like a part financially, but also a part business-wise, and also a part time-wise and. Of course, you have to ask yourself, am I emotionally ready to put this amount of time in there? But I think um, what I've been doing for the past year or so is, or maybe two years, is only finish the, the games which have like a giant marketing um, nebula work, uh, kind of hovering over it. And by that, I mean, um, let's just take Bounden, for instance, the mobile dancing game. It was actually, there was also choreography by the Dutch National Ballet in there, which kind of gave it some sort of weird credibility uh, for a, a traditional press to also write about it. And when I, I, I liked the idea of making people, to, to making people dance, and I, I already had the prototype, but I wasn't really planning on making it into a full game. But when it hit me that I could ask the Dutch National Ballet, and I called them and they said yes, it was. It needed to happen, right? Because suddenly I knew that I could not only make the game, but I could, I could also talk about it and sell it. So I think like these things need to really come together, and that's when I think you really need to start finishing your game. Um, I think like for for me and for Bounden, that was very obvious for me, is, is seeing the Dutch National Ballet on the credits list, and um, that was a very almost easy way of, of knowing that I could could at least talk about it with other people uh, other than for instance gamers um, and for you that's maybe going to be difficult more difficult if you're gonna make yeah different kinds of games um, but yeah I would still search for like that 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 thing that makes it really easy for you to also talk about it that makes it like instantly clear that there's something interesting to the concept that other people want to talk about or dive into so that's kind of what I've what I'm thinking about when I think about what games I should finish. And in, in the same matter, I'm actually going to give away one of my ideas right now. Um, so I'm working on another mobile dancing game. Are all of you familiar with Silent Disco? Yeah, so for those who are not, um, Silent Disco is when a lot of people in a room, will say 20 or 30 or how many, how many you want, 100, they're all wearing headphones. And uh, in my game, they're wearing headphones or their earplugs um, into their phone. So normal silent disco, everyone's uh, like dancing to the same kind of music, and uh, you know everyone's like hobbing. But if you take off your headphones, there's no music, and it's really weird that everyone's dancing at the same time. Um, so that's silent disco. It's super fun. Um, but in my game, everyone is still doing hobbing on the same rhythm, but everyone's listening to different kinds of music. So Tino is listening to classical music, doing all these strange, <laughs> and I'm uh, I'm listening to uh, I don't know electro, and I'm like yeah yeah, and someone else is doing the jive and etc. Everyone's dancing differently, so the game is that there's pairs of people that listen to the same music. You have to find your other half, <laughs> right? So this reaction, this reaction to me is like that moment, like ah. Oh, Yes, people are like, oh, this is interesting. I want to try this. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, everyone can picture it. And maybe this also has something to do with the way I, I tell you about it. But even when I was not, uh, even when I told it to someone for the first time in a completely different way, they still had this moment of like, ah, oh, I get it. I want to try this. And like seeing that moment in other people's eyes was really, for me, that was the moment when I realized, ah, oh, this is a game I should finish. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, it's it's really trying to find like this this kind of spark about um, whether you can talk about it to people and whether they're like super super coming kind of coming towards you with their like, oh, I'm interested. Oh, tell me more. So I don't know. That's that's really what I try to to find for uh, try to find in uh, in games I want to. In games and prototypes I have, in order to decide whether I want to finish them. All right. Any other questions? 
I have a question about uh, conflicts of vision and game design philosophy. Like, um, well, in my school, I'm an artist. I'm supposed to be an artist, but I like to mess a bit with game design. And game designers don't like that usually. <laughs> so, and actually, yeah, they're working with game design documents and in a very old fashioned way of game design, mm -hmm. just integrating basic knowledge. And yeah, we're going to make a game with combat, but why combat? But no, we're gonna, just going to put combat in it. Right. And, um, Who's right in that case? How can you make people who disagree because they have other vision, another vision, another philosophy of doing games, uh, making games? Right. How do you make these people work together? Like, yeah. I don't know if I can work with these people. Right. This yeah. Is yeah. You have a very good point. <laughs> I'm gonna turn off my mobile phone. I don't know why someone's calling me. Um, I think maybe they don't necessarily have like very different approaches. They just have different visions, right? And um, I, what I what I try to do, and maybe I'm really an asshole for that, but if uh, if people, <laughs> how do I say this in a nicer way? What I what I try to do always is when I need to work together with other people, I need to work together with other people's visions. Then they tell me their vision, and I try to like also make the vision kind of mine, and then still like take take the space within it, like make all the ideas that are still within that vision. And if people change their vision, I'm just going to fall back to the fact that they told me their vision. And that's exactly what I'm trying to do here. So whose problem is it now, right? If they're not, if they're not happy with the work that you are delivering because it doesn't fit their vision, well, I'm sorry, but you told me this was your vision. And so I think it's really a, a lot about communication there, right? It's, uh, you know this, of course, but, uh, um, how do I, how do I answer your question? But you know, at the same time, there's this problem that if everybody agrees on something, then something's wrong in a way because there's no real direction or vision for the game if you make a game that everybody is um, happy to work on. Really? Do you think so? Because, I mean, let's say everyone let's let's say everyone agrees that we want to make a game about what it's like to f to be a bee. It's like they agree, but it's not really their vision. It's like more a consensus or something. It might also be that the idea is vague enough that they can have ten different like, individual right. organizations yeah. and they all think they're great, but it's not the same one. Right. Yeah. So what do you do then? Yeah. I mean, it's that's really difficult. At Game Oven, I think that's exactly that's one of the core reasons why we quit because the the co-founder and I um, we had this for some little things. And it yeah it caused enormous struggles between us where, um, yeah his uh, like you're saying his ideas were just different than mine which is okay and they both kind of still fit in the in the same um, um, vision. But because I considered myself to be to have the role of game designer, I kind of said well I'm just going to decide what we're going to pick. Um, so I think that might be a solution to just have really strict roles. Um, but and see, as an artist, I don't really can do that because they're the designers. I'm the artist, so I should just do assets and. Right, and uh, that's where it becomes really complicated. Yeah, and I, I, I think I don't think I have an, an answer for you there. And there's like four people who are like, <gasps> I have an answer. Okay, we're gonna go, Tino. Well, in, in some cases it works to have like a vision holder, the person that, that yeah. protects that, that core idea. And then when there is a discussion, like a heated discussion, there is the one person that always has sort of the last say. He tries to sort of listen to everyone's input, but there has to be a decision because it's yeah. worse to not do something than to do something and fail. So the decision has to be made. So at, at that point you have a lead or a vision holder that has the final say if there's like an argument or a discussion. But how do you choose? It, it, it comes from the team. Who do yeah. you trust to make the right decision? Yeah, okay. hmm. I mean, oh, uh, sorry. you wouldn't want to feel comfortable working in a team where you don't trust the lead, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> makes sense. So as you were saying before, with like being a pure game designer, right. being a short all, I think where is like the pure game designer, they have a lot to prove. Because like they're the, the idea guys, <laughs> the or whatever. Right. Right. So they need to get everyone else on board with their ideas. Right. Because 
I don't know. I, when I went to game design school, I had a bunch of classmates that were like that. They just wrote a bunch of ideas on paper, and they never saw the light of day. Right. They, yeah. They were like, unable to either convince someone to make them, or they made it just bad. I don't know. Right. But that's when I learned to program. It's like I don't want to be dragged down by you guys. <laughs> right. I can do this myself. Yeah. Right. Uh, and I feel that's really helpful to get people on board. Because right. like, when you're, a you're the designer, you've got to convince people that this is good. Exactly. And on the upside, you can also make prototypes of other people's ideas and say, exactly. this is bad because, yeah. but this is like, I, I doubt this because, and you can discuss it. Right. So maybe you're saying the proof is in the budding, and bit, maybe yeah. the, all the problems that you have is, um, can be more easily solved if you ask all those people that have very different opinions and different ideas to just prove that there's what their stuff is and that it works and that it's exactly what everyone wants. So maybe if you kind of are able to make a setup like that so that everyone gets to prove their stuff, um, that may, that's maybe going to help you. And if, if there is some sort of consensus on what people want or some sort of vision, then you can measure um, the, based on that consensus or vision which uh, idea to go for. Because if you have something in front of you, you can test it and you can measure its effectiveness, right? So, yeah. Um, yeah, you want to say something about that? Yeah. Uh, well, for the whole amount of sleep development, uh, the whole problem was that everyone kind of wanted to do a little bit of everything. And we had, like, the whole idea of the game was what sold the game, but we never really managed to secure one common vision because everyone's like, I love this idea. And instantly, like, this is what the game is for me. Uh -huh. And for like three years we were making the game, that was constantly the issue. Like we got to like discussing and at the end of every discussion, the discussion's like, well, the problem is that we don't really see the same thing. <laughs> and it's like, okay, well, what do we do about that? <laughs> that sounds pretty terrible. <laughs> but but I, I generally think that it's, it's all about the team and the project. Like every team is different, every project is different. So it's, it's kind of hard to tell like a general rule, I think. Yeah, but having a good vision, I, I totally agree that that's more important than having an idea. I think uh, we've heard some good things where you said like having a having a lead can be something. Uh, where uh, Martin said, you know, the proofs in the pudding make everyone just prove their stuff before it, uh, it's there. And yeah, just don't leave it up in the air, right? That's that's I think that's a really good advice uh, on that level. Yeah. Um, okay. Also in the file, so even more because I just think that the problem designers or actually the, the big problem with working with designers in the company where you have uh, artists when you have like uh, uh, people who make the game like the assets and code the game and the designer is that designers usually come from different backgrounds and I don't know guys how it is in your countries but uh, many there are like no game design schools so game designers come from theatrology, film, uh, mo mo movie uh, nice. industry and you know a lot of uh, script writing for example so we had this designer in the company when we made the casual games uh, and he had the uh, script writing um, experience and he just made movies before so uh, it was the, the biggest problem was to translate his language from the movie language to the game language right. and I think a lot of designers they have their own backgrounds for example it doesn't have to be exactly movie or theater or anything like that it could be for example games they like right. or it's something that they, yeah. they're really into and uh, you as a for example if you're making assets or if you are a coder or if you are uh, in a lead of a team you have to somehow try to translate the language of your designer to, to the language of the other people or vice versa if you are a, a actual um, designer then you have to understand that there, for example, people who are making assets, they have a better vision to, right. for example, draw a location than you could have. So, so you're basically saying if someone is designing a thing, you need to also to kind of put it in his context. Yeah. But I mean, that's also really difficult, I guess. Yeah, and also when you are a designer, you have to remember that your graphic designers, for example, or your music makers or your coders, they know their stuff better, right. so you should trust them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, of course, totally. I agree. I think that's also what you're going to be talking about a lot. Yeah, but I also think like communication is definitely key here. And, and what you're saying is prototypes communicate uh, certain elements much better and clearer than words do. And, and yeah. maybe that fills the gap there, regardless of the background they're from. 
Yeah. So it's just such a valuable skill to have yeah. to be able to prototype an idea. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So um, there's probably more uh, time for questions later. Now it's time for stretching. Yes, let's do that. <laughs> Thank you, Tio. I, uh, I also have a standing desk at home, a permanent standing desk. And uh, I really like also like turning on music. So yeah, while I'm working, I'm doing this. It's nice. Keeping those muscles alive and well, make the blood flow. Really nice. OK, so um, um, up next is uh, something more theoretical. I'm sorry. Um, but it's something I supposedly know think I know something about, and not many other game designers are doing it. So let's just dive into it. I consider physical interaction a big part of games. Yet many games pick existing physical interactions for the game that don't necessarily match with their vision. Let's talk about game mechanics. Game mechanics are the things that enable interaction with the game. That it's the thing that needs input and that affects the state of the game. It's the, the cogs in your game that only spin when the player spins them. You press a button and something explodes. That's, that's a mechanic. Yeah. And to put it in a very, I guess, academic way, it's a, it's a physical act that triggers an in-game event. So, for example, the game mechanics of a first-person shooter is that you walk... Hello. The um, game mechanics of a first-person shooter is that you walk, uh, you aim, and you shoot. And the walking goes to WSD or the arrows. You aim with the mouse and you shoot uh, with clicking the mouse. Of a platformer, it's walking and jumping, and uh, sometimes there's also other mechanics, game mechanics involved. Um, for most third-person or bird's-eye view games, uh, you move a character with a joystick and there's action buttons like slashing or shooting or something. Um, most mobile games have these tap or drag game mechanics. And even computers themselves have a game, game mechanic, which is the mouse. It's a pointer. Um, and you have a, yeah, you use a, there's also a weird translation there, but we'll talk about that later. So I actually, I want to get real technical here. This is, th this is kind of the stuff I, I think about a lot. Um, because I think game mechanics work with some sort of strange simplification or abstraction that is needed to translate that physical act to the in-game event. Um, and that simple, mod simple model looks like this. So, there's the input, there's the abstraction, and the in-game event. And I think all of this is, is what uh, makes a game mechanic. So the questions, you, you can look at any game and ask yourself, what is the physical input of the player? What is the, which is the input? Which, what is the direct result in the game, which is the event? And what abstraction is required to connect the input and the event? For example, you have a mouse, the physical movement is the you move the mouse on a flat surface. Then there's the abstraction of a pointer. And then there's a pointer on a flat surface on a, on a different plane, moving up and down, and left and right. So you cannot connect the mouse with the pointer directly. It's not possible because it's first it's first of all it's a different plane, right? And there's a weird concept of a of a virtual presence. So that's why I'm, I'm saying that, this, that there's definitely some, something happening in between here. Um, and this is, well, who can guess? A platformer. The physical act is that you press these buttons, left or right. Then there's this abstraction of walking, of walking into one direction. And then there's a character that actually walks left or right. This is a, a platformer for jumping. Um, press up, there's the abstraction of jumping, and then a character jumps. For first-person shooters, I am so, like, when I wrote this down, I was just so confused that we understand this at all. <laughs> it's just the weirdest thing. You move a mouse on a, on a flat surface, 
um, forward, backward, left and right, then there's this super strange abstraction of looking around as being some sort of strange rotation with your head, very mathematical or something. And then there's this really arbitrary uh, rotation of a virtual camera that's the actual in-game event. So yeah, I'm, I'm really, I think this is so weird that, that this is so mainstream. Um, sometimes this also happens with a, uh, with a joystick, of course. And then there's, just for the sake of simplicity, uh, this is how a button looks like. So this is pressing a button, there's the abstraction of pressing a button, and you press a button. And this also goes for, for instance, uh, on your phone, if you tap, you tap a thing, there's the abstraction of pressing a button, it's almost the same thing, and you, you press a button. And this is, would be real life, where there's a button, there's the abstraction of pressing a button, and you press a button, and something else might happen. Okay, so here's the thing. I found that the less difference there is between the input and the abstraction, and the less difference there is between the abstraction and the in-game event, the easier the message is transferred. So what if your game mechanic is a message? I'm, I'm talking about these distances. I'm, this will become, I need to actually, I think I need to explain it uh, a bit better. Okay, so Bennett Foddy, um, the guy who made uh, Quop, probably you guys know him. It's a pretty funny game. He um, was really excited verbally on Twitter um, about this pancake flipping game. So basically how it works is, uh, on your phone, um, if you hold the the button, uh, hold the, the if you touch the screen, the pan goes up, and if you release it, the pan goes down. Um, the goal is to flip the pancake as often as you can, and um, make sure that it doesn't fly off the pan anywhere. Um, so I am actually like really a pancake flipping expert, and um, I know that this has barely anything to do with the real experience of flipping a pancake. So let's talk about that, all right? So imagine the exact same game, exact same game with this mechanic, right? So maybe you hold a phone and you can see the, f the, the, the pan and the pancake from the top and then you fly it around and maybe you also need to catch it. Would the game be more fun? I don't know. Hmm? Maybe, maybe the phone is not the best way, but yeah. I would assume a Wiimote might be better. Yeah, maybe a Wiimote. Sure, yeah. So, yeah, true, that's true. So I'm not sure like, if the game would necessarily be more fun than, than the simple game we just saw, this one. But would this mechanic immerse you more into the experience of flipping a pancake? I think, I think so. Depends. Depends on the execution. Well, your hand will get tired after a much longer than... Same <laughs> happens with pancake flipping. Yes. <laughs> yeah, but then you'll get tired of the game, and then you'll just put it down. And well, if I get tired of making pancakes, I'll just put <laughs> it down. But those are pancakes, you get pancakes out of that. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think, like, the getting tired is maybe a bit... Be, uh, um, beyond the point, um, because what, I, what I'm getting at is that the flicking a phone mechanic, um, the physical act is much closer to flicking a virtual pancake than it is to, um, to tapping uh, uh, and flicking a virtual pancake. So I'm really um, talking about this distance, right? It's, I think it's actually more like this. With the tapping game, where you just tap to flick, uh, to flick the pancake, this really feels like this. Like you tap, where, how, it's really difficult and strange to connect tapping and flipping a pancake. That's why I think that connection is huge, that, um, that transition is huge. Um, the abstraction just comes a long way. So, Consider, oh yeah, you have a question? I think people, um, their intuition is more like what they are used to, what they already know before um, they have your pancake flipping app. Um, so 
it's uh, when you're flipping a pancake, it's really close to the real action. Right. But you're not hold, uh, holding a pen. You're hold, you're holding a right. A phone. That's so, true. Yeah. So people see their phone. Yeah. With with a pancake uh, on it, but they still have the intuition to press because they are used to pressing on a phone. On the right. Screen. Yeah. So for both ways, it's. Uh, uh, you mean there's something to say for both ways? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, of course, and I, I agree with you, but when, it's, when your goal is to immerse people in the experience of flipping a pancake, I'm pretty sure that this mechanic will make you touch that experience more than a game in which you have to do this. Sure, yeah. I mean, ex again, the execution, it doesn't necessarily have to be with the phone, this. Um, but I'm just getting at the fact that the physical, the physical, um, um, input, the physical motion that you do, the, the physical thing, is much closely related to the thing that happens in the game, and that's why the abstract, the the transition from the input to the abstraction, and transition from the abstraction to the thing is much smaller, and that's really what I what I'm trying to get at. Do you, do you still have someone had a question? Uh, not a question, but just the point of golf games. Exactly the same. You you press a button, a charge bar go up, and a far uh, a far the charge bar go, and far the ball will go. Yeah, I mean that's, it's that's the same relation thing. I mean you use it with with, with a swipe, which gets really less. I'm uh, I'm not sure what you yeah and yeah. Does golf get away with it, but pancakes don't. <laughs> golf also shouldn't get away with it, and actually yeah, I'm uh, pretty sure that the you know, we golf gamer actually do this yeah, is massively it's more popular yeah. than any yeah. golf gamer just present. Buttons. And there's actually even uh, a recently a uh, studio from Antwerp, uh, Jon, uh, Glitchnap. Um, actually, they're from Denmark, but they made a golf game where you put an iPad on the floor and you have your phone and you literally have to like do this. And you can see the ball roll on the iPad. So I think that's really getting more and more into the actual experience because the physical act that you do is much more closely related to the experience that the designers have in mind. I think that's really what I'm trying to get at. What do you want to say? Maybe a good comparative example is um, a long time ago you had a game, a Tony Hawk skating game, where you jumped by pressing X. And later on you got a game called Skate, where by jumping like ollieing, you flicked the button. And that felt so much more in line with what you were actually doing in the game. The uh, interaction was a lot more, yeah, sort of Im integrated with what you're doing. Right. So maybe yeah. that, that's that's a good yeah. comparative example. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, already there's like a, it's it's it becomes close. It gets closer to the yeah. the physical thing or the thing that happens in the game. Yeah. So let's say we also finger, right? The finger rubbing game. Let's consider that. Um, um, let's consider its mechanics. So the, the game mechanics of the thing is, uh, the, f the physical input is that you have to rub each other's fingers, the abstraction is the abstraction of rubbing each other's fingers, and the in-game event is that you rub each other's fingers. I think this makes a lot of sense. Um, so now imagine playing Fingal with buttons. So now you press buttons. And now a virtual hand is mo will be moving around. And now suddenly, the abstraction that is needed is in between there. And now there's a long way from going from pressing the buttons to uh, the abstraction of moving your hand. You had a question? Yeah, so in the previous slide, you said the, um, to what are these types? Is it like the, the action, the, the, in the input, the, event, right? the input, the abstraction, and the in-game event. Yeah. Because the really cool thing is whenever I played Fingal with my friends, right? Um, we were playing to finish the level and not to rub each other's fingers. Right. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's like, we're okay rubbing each other's fingers is happening. We're trying to comfortable each other, so it is somewhat awkward, but okay. Yeah. But it's, it's not not even the point in our minds of doing this. this thing. Right. Oh, yeah, for, for me it was. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for me it was. Interesting. Yeah. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, cool. So um, you're saying the Surgeon Simulator was ahead of its time? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, yeah. <laughs> what would Surgeon Simulator be if the mechanics would be more? <laughs> <laughs> if the Surgeon Simulator had good mechanics, it wouldn't be Surgeon Simulator. <laughs> that's also true, yes. <laughs> It's the, it's the f actually, that's a good point that you're making. Where with Surgeon Simulator, the, f the fun of the game is, is the, 
because there is the correlation between what you're doing and what you want to do and the in-game action are so fucking different. That's, that's actually a really good example. The Turbine Simulator sort of plays with that. Like yeah. It gives you very direct control, but the controls are bad. <laughs> right. It's like golfing for the Wii. Right. It's okay, but it doesn't really map one to one. It's right. like the bad pancake for the <laughs> controls. Yeah. And it, but like it, it asks of you to do it well, but right. it doesn't give you like the tools to do it well. It, yeah. As yeah. opposed to like Tony Hawk before, which is like, I'm shit at skateboarding, but I think Tony Hawk is way more fun than skate because <laughs> it doesn't demand as much of me right. because the abstraction lets me be good. Yeah. It's like the Fair action enough. movie equivalent. Yeah. So I can hide, you can hide all of like it's like the time event. You should give a talk about this. This is, sounds like a really interesting topic. But, like, I don't know if you're gonna talk about that, but like quick time events where it's like press X to like climb the mountain and kill the monster. Yeah. Right. right. It's like you get to be awesome and you don't have to be good at anything. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not yeah, uh, yeah, sure. I'm not going to talk about that, but it's definitely a inter very interesting point. <laughs> um, yeah, no, what I want to get was that most, if, if, so what most game designers would do if they want to make a game about awkwardly rubbing each other's fingers is take game mechanics that they know, which could be, for instance, using arrow keys to move a virtual hand around, and then on the screen you can see these two virtual hands and two people can, you know, press on these things and... The, the hands, only the hands on the screen will actually do this. Um, so I think this might capture part of that awkwardness, right? Um, but it wouldn't be as personal, it wouldn't be as awkward, and it wouldn't be as much of an icebreaker as, as this one was. Um, and you had a question. And do you think that VR just adds a new kind of abstract, abstraction with those physical... Uh, so that's a good question. I think uh, with VR, because... Um, the input that you give to the camera, right, is literally the same thing as you as what you would do if you look around. I think that's that's a really strong, strong game mechanic. So, um, yeah, does that answer your question? Uh, could we use it for something else than for looking around? For and that's a good question. I don't know yet. I guess we have to make like a thousand uh, ideas on that. Okay. Make a game where you could be blind, but use the Oculus Rift. You can't see anything. <laughs> sure, let's do it. Um, make make a prototype. Um, yeah, I guess like that should be possible. There's there's sensors and ways to give input to the Oculus um, that you might be able to connect one to one to something else than looking around. And that's definitely really interesting. You like strap an Oculus to each hand. You have a boxing game because you have two sensors. <laughs> yeah, so you use it for other stuff. And your fists can see the screen. Well, you don't need to see the screen. Okay. You can still use a different device to to see, but you can use the sensors in different ways if you want to. You can also just use your phones then. Uh, two phones. It's not high tech. Anyway, <laughs> super fun ideas. Um, okay. So what I wanted to get at is, and th th you already kind of touched on, upon this, the pancake flipping game on your phone is not necessarily a bad game. In fact, I think it's su a super fun and kind of addictive game, and that was really, I think, the goal of the designer. But game mechanics contain these huge jumps that I think they're less meaningful or interesting experiences, like less getting into the actual feel of, of that experience. So what I think about is, can a first-person shooter make you experience the awkwardness of touching? Or um, can jumping and walking a platformer really teach you anything about uh, math? Or can a top-down game or twin-stick controls really make you learn to dance or teach you to dance in real life? And I think most of you would agree that, it, that maybe if you put it like that, it doesn't really make any sense. Um, yet almost all of us are sinners in a way and we still use these these couple mechanics that we all know like first person shooters and platformers and top down moving etc um, and it's really difficult to get away from that but i think this is like a way you can look at this to maybe come up with some other stuff you had a question didn't you no okay never mind um so how do you make these game mechanics with small jumps? That's, of course, the, the practical part about this. And we already talked about this. Um, this vision thing, I think, if you focus on that and consider game mechanics something you can invent, you can make your own game mechanics, hallelujah, um, 
then it's definitely possible. So how do you want players to feel? How are you going to make them feel it? But is there also maybe a, a physical way to do that? Is there real world actions that people already do to experience that thing that you want them to experience? Um, for instance, with the, 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 um, the walking over the water, the skipping stones, the slow motion video that I had, maybe I can find a way, maybe with the Kinect, I don't know, maybe there's other technology that can help me to make players actually like make this kind of movement. Maybe that's an idea. I'm, I'm just saying something from the top of my mind. Um, because this would of course be much more immersive and, and much more, um, yeah, I guess immersive is the right word, into the experience of doing that in real life um, than tapping in buttons. And uh, again, I don't think exactly what you're saying that if you're not really good at doing this or you get tired real fast that maybe that's it doesn't ma mean that the other kind where you just tap a button to do the same thing is a bad game I'm just saying that probably it's going to be more impactful um, yeah what do you think about Skyrim with the Omni treadmill with the what Omni treadmill I've never heard of the Omni treadmill <laughs> Okay, so it, it, that's, isn't that the thing that you can just walk, like, um, and yeah. And then yeah. you can just turn. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's pretty cool. I've never actually walked into it. But also, I'm, I'm, I'm really wondering, like, I mean, have you, have you ever been in one? No, it's, yeah. pretty, it's pretty accurate. Yeah, but is, is it also, do you feel like you're walking? Uh, actually, you're a bit lift up, so you can also use oh. it to... You're touching the ground, but you're not really pressed oh, on the ground. So okay. Tested it at the Gamescom, but uh, yeah, okay. It's well, pretty I, accurate. I mean, it's it's definitely really interesting. Um, my mom doesn't have one at home. That's a problem, I think. But yeah. <laughs> it could be used for other things other than Skyrim. No, f any anything walking, I guess. The problem is you're playing Skyrim like a big game. Fastly tired or something like that. Yeah, know. maybe, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, actually, in the back. Uh, yeah, uh, I got uh, the only uh, Kickstarter uh, thingy, so if, I, if it comes in, I can, I can just play it. Okay. But I just want to make uh, simple games because I don't have the Oculus Rift yet, so I can't uh, go full immersion. Okay, right. So I just make uh, small games like Frogger, let them walk. Right, right. Like hit by a car. <laughs> and then get hit by a car. Yeah. Force feedback. <laughs> Go on. I suppose at the end of the day, games just produce experiences. And yeah. one experience is not necessarily better than the other. It's just depending on the person which experience is preferred. So if you play Skyrim, but you prefer to play it with a controller, that's completely fine. If you prefer to play it with an Omni uh, treadmill, then that's completely fine too. Yeah. Depending on the person, one would prefer the one or the other. I mean, you prefer Tony Hawk playing with jumping axe. <laughs> I really, really enjoyed the, uh, the skate mechanic. So uh, yeah. different but players, I, different preferences. Yeah, but I think even beyond preferences, I think, would you still agree that if you get to walk in the, in the Omni, if you get to actually walk, it would probably like, feel much more like walking, right? I, I think I would be a lot more invested in the actions I do in the environment. Yeah. That's true. That, yeah, fair enough. You can't hold shift anymore. <laughs> oh, there you go. Um, so, yeah. Um, vision. So how I actually figure this out is I have the vision. I try to find interactions with that vision that, you know, if I, I want to make people feel awkward. What are real life situations, real life interactions between people that people uh, will feel awkward uh, with? Um, so touching each other's hands is a, is a very specific interaction already. I, I was directly inspired by that. But dancing together has actually many interactions uh, to be inspired by, like synchronously moving your feet, uh, pushing and pulling each other, uh, lifting each other, holding each other, um, looking at each other. So. Yeah, there's a lot of interactions that I could have picked, but I, I picked the one that, you know, uh, made people uh, swing their arms. So, um, yeah, I, I have, I have so many, so many, I have way too many notes here. It's ridiculous. Um, so, <coughs> what I'm, I guess what I'm 
trying to also get at is that vision is also guaranteed to include some sort of interaction. And um, I think if you can get inspired by those moments, those interactions in real life, maybe sometimes between people, then there's that there's game mechanics in there. It's it's definitely worth the thought. And uh, I hope that there's going to be more game designers that think about inventing their own game mechanics so that we get to explore more interesting mechanics and maybe eventually get more, even more immersive uh, games than that we have now. So what I also think is that if the game mechanic contains kind of the most fundamental interaction of your vision, then if your players need to understand how to play the game and need to do that interaction, they are already getting your vision, right? Are, are you guys following me? So, yeah. If the game is to rub each other's fingers, then, and you have to rub each other's fingers, then people are getting it, you know, oh, rubbing each other's fingers. I have one question. Yeah? How did you actually come up with the idea of game about rubbing each other's fingers? <laughs> Um, so I, um, before, before I made that game, I saw people on a large multi-touch screen accidentally touching each other's hands and they were like super awkward about it. Like they would accidentally touch each other's hands and be like, Ugh, I touch your hands. And like they wouldn't, they wouldn't say it, but you would see them like retract their hands and be like, ooh, I do. You have sweaty, warm hands. And that was, that was the inspiration for it. Yeah. Yeah. How do I make people feel more awkward than they already do? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got it. Woo! Yeah, I mean that's. I, I just have a. I have a knack for that, for making people feel awkward. Um, now you have to top that in the second uh, the sequel to the game. What's that again? Uh, now you have to top that in the sequel. Yeah, I know. I'm touching feet. I'm touching feet. I'm thinking about it. I'm thinking about it. It's very difficult. <laughs> I can tell you, but there's a lot of things people find awkward. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's brainstorm about this later, right? How did you play test that? How did that work? I, I made a prototype and um, I played it for the first time with my neighbor. And uh, my neighbor had uh, really large, warm, sweaty hands. And that really, uh, really made me feel the way I thought it was going to feel. <laughs> really awkward. <laughs> um, also, huh? Callister knob? What is it? Oh, I don't know about that. I don't remember. I j I j what I really remember is like the aura of his hand and like the, the, the wet, the sweaty. I don't know. It's really strange. <laughs> oh, every hand is warm and sweaty, isn't it? Maybe, maybe. Um, he, um, he, I don't remember. I don't remember. I just remember the warm and sweaty feeling. That was really what I was going to get at. <laughs> I think he had a lot of hair on his hands, yeah. Um, but yeah, so that's how I play tested it. It was pretty straightforward. Yeah, just made prototype, see whether it works. And actually, the funny thing about that first play test was that because I, have, I had never played the game before, I thought, I, in my mind, people, I was, so this wasn't the first one I tested, right? So two fingers and one finger doing this. And at first I thought, well, I want people to stay, to keep doing this for like a while. And I thought it was a good idea to do that for like half a minute. And that was like the worst idea. So there I was like with my neighbor doing this for half a minute. It was the worst thing. <laughs> Terrible. Anyway, yeah, that changed like real quickly into like six or seven seconds, which is enough for people to like get to a point where they're like, okay, okay. This is really awkward, and then kind of get to talk about it, but not beyond that. I didn't necessarily need, to g need the game to be that. Yeah? Uh, I didn't play the game, but is there some kind of music that's... Uh, Just for this kind of weird situation, those kind of music? Yeah, it's a Bauchi Kawawa music. <laughs> okay. Actually... Um, There's also the sound effects, like the way you finish the level. Yeah. I mean, all these things are all about, you know, making people feel really awkward about the fact that they're touching each other's hands. And that's, I really try to make the design focused on that, right? So I really tried to throw everything out that wasn't that. So there's no points or any, any of that. 
it's just about you know doing these things and then feeling really awkward about it. So there's like 70s porn music. There is um, there is backgrounds uh, which are all tinted in red and orange. You know the so, yeah um, no not not entirely. It I mean it's it gives like this sensual feeling because we because that's what we um, associated it with. So that like all the aspects of the game are trying to communicate this one thing, which is awkward. And that's really, uh, I mean, eventually it goes beyond that. And that's what you experienced as well, where it became like a, more of a twister and a puzzle for your fingers. And yeah, that's, that's okay. But that was not necessarily the initial uh, design goal of the game, which is interesting. You want to say something? So if you have, have players that are so invested in the common goal, where they sort of are not awkward anymore, do you then feel that you've sort of filled your job as a designer? Because you wanted to make people feel awkward rubbing their fingers? Right. <sighs> like, I'm really proud. I'm really proud if people get to the point where they're like, I don't feel awkward anymore. But I think I'm more proud when people are like, like having red faces from touching each other. And so, so the question is, the answer is no. Uh, I'm not proud at, I'm not necessarily proud that, at that part, not as proud as making people initially feel really awkward about it. And that was really the, the focus of the game, uh, the game design for me as well, yeah. <laughs> oh, of course, <laughs> everything about this game kind of suggests at like a romantic, warm, sweaty situation. Like that's kind of the. There are people who are actually using it this way. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay, so I okay. Here's a couple of uh, funny data points. Um, my lawyer. <laughs> he um, has a kid, and he calls it a fingal baby. Now imagine what happened, right? <laughs> they played Fingal and uh, things happened. Um, the sister of my best friend had a boyfriend back then and she fingled with someone else. <laughs> and he was so jealous that he broke up and now she has a relationship with the guy that she played Fingal with. <laughs> like, and I, I have so many of these stories. Uh, uh, Vlambeers, uh, Rami, he um, met Adriel at PAX a couple of years ago and then on the airplane, they played, they played Fingal for three hours. And they're like super open and honest about the fact that that really kickstarted their relationship. Like that aroused all these intimate feelings for them. So yeah, there's like a lot of really beautiful uh, stories about that, about yeah, people getting hooked on awkward. Yes. <laughs> well, uh, no. <laughs> to Fingal each other, yeah, it's, yeah, no. It, it, mm. Fingal or not Fingal. Um, it wasn't necessarily. It, it was the best name we could come up with. And it, it kind of feels kind of the way I want the game to feel. Fingal. <laughs> yeah. And you could use this verb. That's pretty nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly. Um, so, yeah. I mean, uh, let's get back to, to this. It's, I'm, I'm always done here. So, um, I knew what interaction I wanted to have with Fingal, for instance. And um, now I needed technology to capture these interactions. And um, for Fingal, it's pretty obvious as well. Like, I could have two hands on an iPad. I, I discovered that an iPad can have 11 touches. I have no idea why it is 11. Um, it's like. <laughs> it's like, maybe hand. No. Um, so there's actually one level in the game uh, which, has, which requires 11 fingers. Yeah, it's a thing. So um, what I want, what I do want to say on this is, so if you have a vision and you know what kind of interactions you uh, you can use to get to this vision, then finding like the matching technology is is I think the next step. And technology is really the br in the broadest sense of the word. So people could be technology themselves in a card game, for instance. And actually, for Finga, I would say that people are also part of the technology, um, but of course, the iPad is as well, because the iPad enables me to check whether people are doing it, um, the interaction I want them to. So with French Trap, for instance, the mechanic is maybe a bit weird, because the game plays you more than anything else. So people are really the, the, the interactions there. And uh, the game isn't really about 
the game is just about the, r the rule that people need to stay together. Uh, maybe I didn't explain enough about the game for you to understand this. Sorry. Um, so yeah, I mean, for actually for most of my visions and games, prototypes that I'm working on, this is often like the part where I'm kind of stuck, where I'm, I need to think about how I can enable these interactions or, or find other interactions that, I, that are, have more obvious te technologies uh, attached to them. And um, yeah. So um, if you then have a game mechanic you came up with, you, have a vi you had a vision, you knew what interactions to, to, uh, to, to do, you found technology, so now you can play test it, you make a prototype, play test it, and then what happens to me most of the time is that I can almost automatically uh, f figure out like how the game around it works. Oh, um, for this mobile dancing game, we had this sphere, um, and by putting markers on top of the sphere, we could uh, steer people to do uh, this kind of motion. So what if we put them in a very uh, um, sequential order and then make people do an actual choreography because now we can do that. So it, it really, it, it came almost naturally. I can imagine that for some uh, game mechanics that's not necessarily the case, but you know, game development is, can be difficult sometimes. So yeah, I think that with the right vision and patience and discipline to search for your visions, interaction and, and connecting technology, we can force people to have the kinds of interactions that, uh, that align with these visions. And you put, you put them at the heart of your game, the interaction of your, ga of, uh, of your game at the game mechanics. I, sometimes uh, there's a lot of people in the academic world that say that the thing that games the way the games stand out from other sort other media is interaction, right? So, yeah, I think this is this is really important. So only allowing people to interact with your game in the exact same ways that they interact with your vision for them to learn and understand that interaction, I think that really has an impact. And yeah, we can be inspired by interactions between people and make game mechanics. We can do that. I just wanted to make sure that you know that you can do this. So. I'm really up for like playfulness. Uh, I want to bring back playfulness in the real world um, between real human beings. That's really what I try to do. Um, and yeah, that's um, kind of what I wanted to uh, talk about. I this is a thing for me. What? Uh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that, do do. Does any of you have more questions? Yes.